This time you came to China and bring your new book. So would you please give us a short uh, introduction about the main points in your book? Well, the main points are that it would benefit countries, especially a country like China, mm -hmm. to not only look at the debt, but also look at the asset size. And perhaps if you think about um, an economy, a, a public, the public sector in China, with, um, with the same eyes as with a corporation, in other words, with a balance sheet, then you would see that the problems that are often discussed with the, the high debt levels in China, perhaps if we knew more about the asset side, we would see that the net worth, so the assets minus the debt, would actually be quite substantial. So China would actually be a very rich and confident country that could look to the future with great uh, strength instead of being so worried about the debt. Um, but that requires that we know more, that we have better transparency about the assets, not the least the, the public assets, the public commercial assets. So, but how can we classify which kind of assets can be included as the government public assets? In a simplistic way, you can classify public assets into policy assets okay. and commercial assets. Okay. So policy assets are all the assets that are funded mm -hmm. by taxes, mm -hmm. which means um, operations like everything from defense, schools, uh, social security, medical, etc. Mm -hmm. Those operations are po uh, policy operations and policy assets, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, while any uh, operations or assets that receive their funding from the market, from clients, customers, from business, etc., um, could be seen or it could be seen as commercial assets because they could be valued in a commercial way, the same way as if they were privately held. In your book, you claim like the government actually has a tremendous asset, but some of them didn't realize it and manage it properly. Those assets, you mean it's both policy assets and commercial assets, right? Well, we are looking primarily at the commercial assets. Commercial. Yes, so if you look on a global basis, mm -hmm. uh, public commercial assets is the world's largest wealth segment. And it's uh, like this in every country, including in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have made a very conservative estimate of this wealth segment and come up with a number which is um, uh, equal to one times GDP. And, but this is only uh, public assets at the national level, so only at the mm -hmm. state level. And it's only book value, mm -hmm. so which means that this is only the tip of the iceberg. This is the very, very top, because the real wealth in a country, including China, is at the local government level, provincial level and local government, municipality and city, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, why it's relevant to call this uh, the tip of the iceberg or an iceberg in itself is because when we talk about public assets, we usually talk about SOEs. This is what the debate has been about for the last 20 or 30 years. But we, every country, especially, uh, not especially China, but China is the same as most countries in the world. Even if every country likes to feel that they're special, there are more similarities than there are, are differences. So uh, the biggest wealth segment within public assets is real estate. Mm -hmm. And that is often the most intransparent uh, segment of public wealth uh, and um, that is for a number of reasons and partly because governments have a tendency to not uh, be very good at registering their, their, how, uh, how much they own. They really, most governments in the world don't know how much assets, how many real estate assets they own. Mm -hmm. And But it's also a matter of classification that they try to make it more complicated than is actually necessary. You think what's the difference um, in the quantity and quality and the structures of Chinese public assets? Well, the structure is probably you know, quite similar in most countries. Uh, however, of course, uh, a transition economy like China probably has a larger share of public assets than maybe European countries. The surprising fact is probably that many people think that US have less 
I would probably guess that the US has more public assets than, than, than Europe um, and, and um, is also less transparent in many ways than many European countries. So it's, it's not like China is uh, worse than anybody else. Mm -hmm. I think most countries are pretty much uh, the same. There are only a few countries that have better transparency. So do you think there's any unique, uh, any unique challenges that China government is facing up for managing the public assets? So when you're governing uh, a portfolio of public assets, you're not intervening in the day-to-day -day management. Uh, so governing public assets is pretty much a similar challenge all over the world. Um, once you have made the distinction between policy assets and commercial assets, uh, and you realize once you have made that distinction and you have separated the commercial assets uh, from the policy assets, then if you acknowledge that these are actually commercial assets and they are actually competing with the private sector, then you also realize that they should be managed in the same way as if they were privately held. Because otherwise the market will demand that they are privatized because it's an unfair competition. It's like playing football with, between two teams and one of the teams get to take one of their players to play the referee as well. That would not be very fair and the other team would probably say, we don't want to play. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so if you have a, uh, the referee coming from your team, you have to make sure that the other team trusts that this person is not involved. So the governments owning public assets need to make sure that there is a separation between regulation and ownership. Between if, if, when we're talking about commercial assets. 在新国富论一书中呢，邓达德指出，目前许多国有财富都处于隐而不见的状态。全球范围内，大多数国家呢，对于旗下的财富都只有拼拼凑凑和不完整的一个概念，缺乏一个完善的资产清单。邓达德还强调，制定详细的资产负债表对于政府管理公共财务来说呢，显得十分重要。只有正确的理解了政府本身的资产负债结构，才能够更好的对政府的财政和预算做出规划。And you also mentioned in your book that the balance sheet is very helpful for managing the public assets. Now why can you explain that? It's all a difference. It's a technical thing which sounds very boring, but it's actually extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's called single entry bookkeeping versus double entry bookkeeping. Because single entry bookkeeping was invented 10,000 years ago to manage when, when people were shipping goods down the river to trade them make sure that no goods disappear during the journey. Um, and then it took until the 1200s in, in, uh, in Italy, which is equivalent to the Yuan dynasty mm -hmm. in, in China, uh, when the Italian merchants invented double entry bookkeeping, mm -hmm. which means that single entry bookkeeping is like you receiving a bank statement. Mm -hmm. It says how much money you have come in and how much money you've spent. This does not tell you anything about profit or wealth. It only tells you about in and out. Mm -hmm. You could have sold something and expect payment later and it wouldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. And you could have bought something or promised somebody to pay something and just made a, a note, I will pay you in one year. But it won't say in a single entry bookkeeping, it won't tell you anything uh, that you have made a promise to pay. And in the government, this could be a pension that you have lots of people that you're promising to pay pension in 30 years from now, or that you're promising to take care of medical uh, uh, <coughs> and social security for them. It doesn't show when you have a single, because in a, like a budget or a bank statement. Mm -hmm. It's only when we invented the double entry bookkeeping that we started to understand what is profit and we could understand and make a record. I've actually made a promise. So I'm not as rich as I am, to, uh, as, and this made us understand wealth, and this creates a balance sheet. So without the balance sheet, we do not understand wealth, profit, or risk. Mm -hmm. And this is why uh, most governments in the world have a problem, because they're not using balance sheets. So they don't understand if they really are wealthy or really poor, and that's why everybody's focusing on debt instead of net worth. But as you said, balance sheet is so important, but China government haven't released 
their uh, balance sheet yet. So what do you think of obstacles that um, they are not doing this? To be fair, there are only maybe five to ten countries in the world that are, you know, have really succeeded in a, this journey to produce a proper balance sheet. But technically, uh, it's not very difficult, but it takes time for a government. Um, but the most important thing is, again, political will. You, I mean, the government must want to be uh, transparent and to show visibility and to understand the, the importance of showing its people uh, what is my wealth. Because uh, the traditional measure of using uh, debt over GDP is completely irrelevant. Uh, debt is a financial number mm -hmm. and while GDP is a statistical number, it has nothing to do in a financial statement. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, like comparing apples and pears. Mm -hmm. And that's why in order to have a proper understanding of your wealth and profit and how it looks for the future, if you really have a strong economy or not, you need to have a balance sheet. What's the process of the Chinese government for this balance sheet right now? I, I'm not sure, but you have a, a couple of initiatives in, in the academic world doing this. Uh, and uh, I've heard that some uh, local governments have produced balance sheets. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it would be very interesting to see them and, and discuss uh, their methods. If Hopefully they're using IFRS, which is, is the internationally acknowledged method to do this. and. Um, uh, it's very important to use internationally acknowledged uh, methods because what is important in business or in finance is to be able to compare. Mm -hmm. if, we don't, if we can't compare, uh, we are just making it difficult for the public and for all stakeholders to understand mm -hmm. how is your financial situation really. And you know, my, my view is that uh, most countries like China are actually worrying too much because like most governments or national governments or cities, you are sitting on a gold mine. Mm -hmm. But all you see is the debt. Mm -hmm. You don't see, you don't have visibility on the assets. So you're worrying too much instead of seeing that you're actually very strong, very wealthy. But if you don't know the value of your assets, you don't know the yield either. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it feels like you're very poor. 国有企业呢是中国基本经济制度的重要组成部分。那如何深化国企的体制机制改革，提高运营效率和发展质量，是中国目前面临的重大的现实问题。与许多主张私有化的中外学者不同的是呢，邓达德认为，国企改革的重点在于建立好的管理机制，建议政府能够成立专业的资产开发公司——国家财富基金，将相关资产的所有权和控制权加以转移，以减少政府的干预，提高运作效率以及工作收益。We have a couple questions about China's SOE reform. As we know, the state-owned enterprise is a very significant part of the uh, government public assets. How do you feel about China's SOE reform in the past? Historically, I mean, since, since, since the uh, uh, economic transformation, the reforms have been, I mean, formidable. I mean, they, the world has never seen anything like what China did in terms of volume, in terms of courage and political will uh, in the 90s, uh, etc. That was amazing. Um, but then uh, it's been less, uh, less strong development. You mean the process of China's SOE reform right now is kind of a slowdown? What's the reason? I would guess political will because technically it's not very difficult. Why do you think China government don't have those kind of political will? Well, it's, it's always difficult for any government. Every leap is very difficult. Maybe it's easier to do the first leap because it's so obvious that this is a huge problem. Uh, political will depends very much on uh, a, a consensus of a crisis, of a necessity. Politically, these are very uh, tough issues to deal with. So in every political system, you don't want to deal with this until it's absolutely necessary and until you really see that the problems that you will cause are much smaller than the gains that you will get. And maybe the, the amount of people that will be affected is much smaller than the, people, the amount of people that will be 
uh, uh, benefited. Mm -hmm. So in the early 90s, the restructuring you know, uh, uh, had an impact on millions and millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. Um, and of course benefited also hundreds of millions pe of people because it took a lot of, you know, half of the population of China out of poverty. It was an amazing uh, achievement. Today, the people that are benefiting from uh, the lack of progress, who would resist further reform, are very few. So the political cost today is much, much less. But it's not the broad um, people, but it's, it's, the, it's more of the elite in every country that then suffers, which is perhaps difficult for a political leadership, um, but the benefit for the people are enormous. Uh, there is an institution called SESEC, right? was established in 2003, okay? So um, what's the reason do you think China set up such an institution to manage the SOEs in China? Well, I was actually um, part of that process, so I, I remember it quite well. And, and there was a lot of discussions already then whether uh, the commercial assets should be governed uh, completely separate from the government in a national wealth fund mm -hmm. or you should take an intermediary step and consolidate them away from the line ministries and into a ministerial unit mm -hmm. and uh, in Sweden we've had both so I just came to China with the experience of having done this in Sweden in both ways, both inside a ministry and outside in a holding company, a national wealth fund. And, and um, it takes a lot more political will to go all the way to a, pu a purely commercial vehicle owned by the government. And the intermediate step is, is the um, um, SASAC version. And um, so this was the um, this was the result of, of that process, okay. that um, uh, the political will was, was only enough to take it this far. In the Xin Guo Fu Deng Da Zhe has talked about the success of the Xin Jiapu Guo Chi Guo Chi and the Xin Guo Chi Guo Chi. In 1974, in the presence of the Xin Jiapu Wu Qing Rui, the Xin Jiapu government created the Xin Jiapu Wu Qing Rui Dai Ma Xi, which is the government of the Xin Jiapu Wu Qing Rui Dai Ma Xi. In the presence of the Xin Jiapu Wu Qing Rui Dai Ma Xi, which is the government of the Xin Jiapu Wu Qing Rui Dai Ma Xi. You also mentioned the Singapore story in this book. Because uh, China and Singapore are both Asian countries, I'm not sure if there are any similarities between those public access management. If there are any um, stories and experience applies equally in China. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, Singapore has probably done the best job in the world of, of managing their public assets. So they have they understood at a very early point. Their vice premier was a very a uh, bright person who, um, who, who made it very clear that he didn't believe that managing commercial assets should be done inside the government um, because he believed that uh, there is ample evidence that this does not, not work. Mm -hmm. So in Singapore, he instead uh, took the initiative to set up two vehicles, mm -hmm. one for the management of liquid assets, which is like a hedge fund, and it's also called sovereign wealth fund. And, and uh, in, um, in China, this is called GIC yeah. or SAFE. Mm -hmm. uh, in Singapore, this is, sorry, CIC in China. Yeah. And, and, and in Singapore, it's called GIC. Yeah. And, and um, so this is uh, managing, like a hedge fund, managing the liquidity side of, of Singapore's wealth. <coughs> the operational assets uh, are <coughs> is managed more in a private equity-like vehicle which we call National Wealth Fund. In terms of the business model, what do you think of the difference between CIC and Tamasek? Oh, it's huge. Uh, you can't compare them because managing liquidity, uh, you are <clears throat> a hedge fund or a sovereign wealth fund is uh, trading uh, liquid shares most of the time. I mean, they're trading things that are, they sometimes go in and, uh, and invest in private equity funds uh, as a shareholder, etc. But you can sell them. If you don't like the performance, 
you can sell and you can leave. You don't have to bother. But in a, a, in a national wealth fund, in a, like a private equity, the, the whole point of owning is not to give up when you don't like the performance. It is to, to, to manage the, the performance, to make sure that they perform better, to be the governance, to be the coach to the company. There are three things necessary for a national wealth fund to function well. It's political insulation, it's transparency, and a clear objective. If you are doing these equally well, like the spokes of a wheel, you're tightening the spokes equally well, the wheel will spin very well. So the commercial, the market efficiency will be very high. If one of the spokes are not as well tightened, the wheel will be bumpy and it will be very difficult to ride that, uh, ride that vehicle. Important when and if uh, there is a similar holding company created for, for, for the SOEs and for the real estate. But the real estate can be done in several ways. It could be one centralized holding company, uh, like some countries have done, like Austria and Finland, etc. Or it can be done in segments, uh, which actually we did in Sweden. So we created one holding company for all the real estate related to railways, one holding company related to uh, uh, all commercial uh, offices, etc. in the country, uh, and one for all universities, and, every th and one holding company for all defense assets, the real estate, mm -hmm. to make this more efficient. First of all, we need to uh, divide the real estate uh, properties into different categories. First of all, you need a list of assets and a market valuation so that you can create a business plan. And then you can decide how do we want to split it up? Do we want to have one consolidated holding company um, or, or, or in segments? But before that, I think uh, you, you, there needs to be a discussion so that the, everybody um, agrees with the um, differentiation between policy assets and commercial assets. This is the most, this is the starting point. The corporate governance structure is a very important aspect of the SOE reforms. So what's the problem of the corporate governance structure in China right now? It all comes back to uh, the idea of if you realize that this is commercial assets, mm -hmm. they should be managed in no different way than commercial assets owned by the private sector. Mm -hmm because otherwise it is like having the referee playing in the football team in one, on one side only. So the separation between regulation and ownership inside the government is essential, mm -hmm. is crucial. And, and that separation uh, should also happen between policy assets and commercial assets. Mm -hmm. Once you realize that you uh, have to manage or sorry, govern these, uh, in an arm's length distance from government so that you don't, f so that the market or any stakeholders feel mm -hmm. that there is an undue interference, that the government is also playing the referee, mm -hmm. that's fine.